Welcome back to session two of the seminar. We spent the first session looking at the issue of the, frankly, the pornographic brain. What lust and pornography has done to our brains. And, and, and recognizing that problem is important in order to find the solution. And, and, and frankly, for most men, this is a problem that they have been unable to tackle on their own. And when you come to terms with the problem, when you finally say, I do have a problem, I am powerless over this thing, that is the first step in the solution. And admitting that and saying, you know what, have I gone an entire year without viewing pornography on the internet? Have I gone an entire month without really lusting after an image and spending more than that millisecond honed in on that? It, it, even the very few men who are watching this, who are, who are not users of, of, of pornography, you have a continual assault coming at you in our culture, whether it's online on the computer or in line at the grocery store or the billboards or wherever it is. And until I can say that I am, I am able to engage in this fallen world with the mind of Christ, until I can say that I truly have the purity of Christ, then I still have a problem to overcome. And that's pretty much all, guys. So as I begin this session, I want to start where we all need to begin and end when it comes to this issue. Let's pray together again. Father in heaven, we come before you and ask once again for your Holy Spirit to speak. Sometimes we don't even know what it is that we need to hear, but you do. And so I pray that you would make those words, audible and inaudible, sink deeply into our hearts, that we might find true healing from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this statement. If you think you can't fall into sexual sin, then you are godlier than David, stronger than Samson, and wiser than Solomon. Again, this is something that affects all guys. We don't want to just hide behind this and say, you know what, it's a problem for some, but I don't really need to think about it. Those three men all struggled in this same area and diminishing the problem by just saying, well, everybody does it. You know, everybody in the church is doing it and I'm not as bad as them. I'll tell you something very serious. There will be many in that day, Jesus said in Matthew 7, who will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do your work? And he will say, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of iniquity. The road to destruction is very broad. So simply pointing at the gravity of the problem for others and saying, well, you know what, it's not as big as a of a problem for me. And so, you know, I'm, I'm like here on the pecking order of moral problems in my life and I set other human beings as my standard. Very unwise. We need to look only to Christ as our standard that we might grow up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So don't look to them. Don't say, at least I'm not as bad. At least I'm not addicted. Let's look to the Bible because the Bible does talk about pornography. The Greek word is porneia. Interesting Greek word, porneia, which is usually translated as fornication. Matthew 15, 19 says that porneia proceeds from the heart. And Jesus actually taught in Matthew 5 that you can practice porneia even in your mind by lusting after a woman who is not your wife. That's adultery. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says that we are to flee from porneia. 1 Corinthians 6.18 also says that by practicing porneia, you are sinning against your own body as we saw in the first session. Sexual sin is self-abuse. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says that we should abstain completely from porneia. Revelation 9.21, those receiving the plagues at the end include, among other things, users of porneia or fornicators would be the English word there for most of these. Revelation 17 and 18 refer to porneia as an analogy in identifying false religion in Babylon, as it's called in the last days. And what an appropriate analogy. Porneia meaning fornication, meaning adulteries and, 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 and sexual impropriety and infidelity. This is what the devil is doing in the last days. Yet the majority of men are, are practicing these things, not necessarily in, in live person like adultery, but adultery in the heart, like Jesus said. And this 
plan to capture men in this way has been a deliberate scheme, a deliberate plan by the enemy of souls for, for thousands of years, frankly. If you go all the way back to Numbers 25 and you find the Israelites right on the borders of, the heavenly, uh, of Canaan, we'll talk about the heavenly Canaan in a moment, right on the borders of Canaan, what was it that the devil tried to do? Well, he, he tried to get Balaam to curse the Israelites. So Balak, the king, hired Balaam. He said, curse those Israelites. Did it work? No, he, he blessed them three times. So then what happens next after that? The devil couldn't get them that way. So the devil brings in his, his ace card. He brings in his trump card, if you will. And he says, bring in those Moabite women. Those Moabite women will tempt the Israelites into sin. And that's exactly what happened. The plan of attack worked perfectly. The Israelites committed sexual immorality with the Moabite women. Now listen to this prediction from 1887. It's a Christian periodical called the Review and Herald. The very same Satan is now working. This is talking about the, the scene um, on the borders of Canaan. The very same Satan is now working to weaken and destroy the people who are just on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. Satan knows it is his time. He has but little time left now in which to work, and he will work with tremendous power to ensnare the people of God upon their weakest points of character. There will be, what? Women who will become tempters and who will do their best to attract and win the attention of men to themselves. Isn't that what has happened in our day today? What a fulfillment that statement from 1887 is in 2014 today. We are looking at a world where there are women who are tempters. Look around, they're coming at you everywhere. You pull up your email and the ad pops up or you're reading the news on the computer. And I didn't want to see this. The devil's trying to gain access to the God's people in the last days. Hey folks, if you're enjoying the program, open up another tab and head over to beltoftruth.tv. You'll see all of our other seminars and topics there from parenting seminars, breaking free from the social control of the power elite through the worldly media and schooling agendas, American history, the history of the pilgrims, history of abortion, overcoming media addictions, bunch of practical topics. And those who believe in our message and want to support the work we are doing, please consider subscribing there. It's free for the asking for those who can't afford the $7 a month, but subscribe at beltoftruth.tv for all of our content. Now, I'll tell you, there's a story behind this. Since 1887, the history that has taken place is absolutely fascinating. I want to introduce you to a man named Alfred Kinsey. Alfred Kinsey is the founder of the sexual revolution of the 1960s. He's the author of two books from 1948 and 1953, which laid the groundwork for the sexual revolution of the second half of the 20th century. His books were called Sexual Behavior in the Human Male and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. They were also known as the Kinsey Reports. Now, Kinsey practiced these things that he preached. He agreed with his wife to practice sexual promiscuity outside of their marriage, including homosexuality. He was the most significant player in normalizing immoral sexual behavior. And his so-called research as a, as a scientist of sexuality included debasing practices that go far beyond what I will even mention. I wish I never heard of them. I'm not going to mention them at all, but this preacher of sexual liberation died at an early age. Now guess who studied Kinsey's material? Well, none other than Hugh Hefner. You, of course, may know him as the founder of Playboy, which was the movement of pornography that took over in America and culminated today with internet pornography just, just absolutely taking over people's lives. Well, with Hugh Hefner, he, he had an interesting statement. He read Kinsey and said, I will be Kinsey's pamphleteer. So in other words, I'm going to take Kinsey's theories that he's written in his book and I'm going to publish them in the form of lewd images known as Playboy and that led to a whole lot more as we know. Now what you see also here, Kinsey is to the movement of pornography and sexual immorality today. Kinsey is to the sexual revolution what Charles Darwin is to evolutionary theory. I put that 
on the screen to, to illustrate the significance of this man in this movement of history. Everybody knows Charles Darwin is the founder of evolutionary theory as we know it today. And everybody knows also from a Christian point of view, evolutionary theory denies God's existence. So where evolutionary theory denies the creator, Kinseyism debases the created. Darwinism denies the creator, Kinseyism debases the created. And both of them, both Darwinism and Kinseyism, turn us into mere animals. See, we're just highly evolved animals, said Charles Darwin, right? And Kinsey said, you know what? We, we can just act like them. We can engage in every form of sexual immorality. There's no, there's no morality with sexuality, he said. Just do whatever you want to do. And that's appropriate and healthy, according to his uh, absurd theories. So it's not only debasing the created and, and, and denying the creator, but we're looking at a, a literal, we're just animals. And, and, and that's exactly what Satan's message has been from the start, right? He wants to debase the image of God in man because God created us as image bearers of him. And then when, when people look at a, a Christian, when people look at somebody with joy and peace in their life and kindness and grace and overcoming sin and holiness, they see Christ in me, the hope of glory, right? Satan doesn't want Christ to be revealed. He wants to debase the image of God in man rather than allow God to reproduce his image in man. Well, this is what has happened in history. And today we see it. The fulfillment of Kinsey's dreams are all around us right on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. Now, isn't that quite a diabolical plan? Now, it is fairly emotionally safe for us to look at history and you know, describe the, the process of how this happened in our culture. But we're about to go someplace that's not going to be quite as comfortable for you. Let's talk about your history. Because really to get to the bottom of this issue of sexual lust, we need to see ourselves in a new light. And that's going to require going someplace emotionally that maybe you've never gone before. But let me ask you this question. Has what you've done so far worked? with regard to overcoming lust? Or do you still find that you are, are a slave to lust? And the eyes just lock on and you just can't help but engage in these practices. If what, has, what you've done is not working, consider trying something different with me today. Be willing to go there. Be willing to go deep with God. It's just about every man's story. It goes something like this. Maybe you haven't looked at, at pornography for, for quite some time. Maybe it was earlier this year. Maybe it was this, this month. Or, or, or maybe this is a weekly thing for you. But you may not even actually view online porn. But, but the lust and the debasing practices are still there for the vast majority, nearly all men. So let's tell your story. That's where we stand today. And let's go back. No matter what your frequency, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, you cannot point to a two to five year period in your life where you've been completely free from pornography or masturbation. You've repented many times, you've asked for victory many times, but you find yourself going back to your habits of the eyes, the thoughts, the actions. You pray, you read your Bible, you try really hard, but you haven't found victory yet. But really, you know what, your story goes back even a little bit further than this present struggle, it goes back to this original template that you received in your life for what sexuality is, how to view sexuality. You got this when you were probably in middle school, right? Instead of learning about sexuality under the guidance of your father, you learned about it from, well, fools. Because it says in the Proverbs that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Proverbs 22, 15. And so you learned, oh, well, what is this thing about sexuality? And, and you have downloaded into your psyche a template for viewing girls, women, sexuality. And, and it's, it's, it's highly immature and, and highly wrong. Uh, you think about the, the kinds of phrases, you know, that would bounce around in the middle school. She's hot, right? Or I got to second base, this kind of thing. It starts to become about, about her as an object and that you're consuming her. But not just that. Probably around this time, you got your hands on your uh, first Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue or a Victoria's Secret magazine or uh, maybe a pornographic magazine even. Uh, if you're a younger, it was probably online porn actually in these early stages. They're actually, in the research, they're actually finding that today's young adults, like college age students, were first exposed to pornography before age 12. 
and presently today's high schoolers, today's 16 year olds were, were exposed to it before age nine. So we're looking at very, very early exposure that came in and started to form our view of sexuality. This is part of almost every man's story. And so what did you learn about sexuality during this key window of development and understanding and adopting a worldview between the ages of 10 and 15, roughly, you, 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 you downloaded a worldview that would affect the rest of your life and how you view women and sexual attractiveness. It, it, frankly, most men today are still living with a corrupted 15-year-old's mindset about sexuality. We don't know how to view it any differently. We don't know, we, we, we were exposed to a situation where basically all we heard in the youth culture around us was, well, the, the pleasure value of a girl, what she can derive for me. You know, middle schoolers and high schoolers don't talk about the spiritual value of, 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 of women and, and, and thinking about marriage and purity. These are just conversations that are very unlikely in this culture of, of fools. And we, are all, we were all one of them. Boy, I wish I could go back many times and, and, and undo some of that. But God can undo it. He's going to retell your story today. But let's continue telling the story. It goes on. When, 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 you, when you become an adult, you still have this early teen view of sexuality. And that has given you a view of masculinity. Rather than having a true masculinity where, where I, I'm here to preserve purity, to protect, to guard, a responsibility to lead, a benevolent concern for women's well-being. You know, this is what God called Adam to when he said, Adam, take dominion over that planet that I just made. Dominion. Well, what have we done? We've gone from dominion to now domination, a counterfeit masculinity. We've gone from caretaking to consumption of women. We've gone from protection to pornography. We've gone from self-sacrifice to selfishness. And it wasn't just that boy culture of middle school. From a very early age, the whole culture around you, everything you see is bombarding men to relate to women on an exclusively visual sexual level. And this needs some undoing. And this needs a miracle because today the eyes lock on to that sexy woman. She appears on the screen, on the billboard, the magazine. Maybe even she's not in, in a, a pornographic setting, but just an attractive, and, and you know what? The eyes take that in, and, and the man has an actual experience with her. No relationship. This is totally divorced from how God designed this to be. God designed that experience to happen between husband and wife. But here now it's divorced from reality. And he just possesses that image, takes it in, and has an experience. She's, it's a passive experience. It's a one-way experience. But it's still a very physiological and neurological real experience, even though it's counterfeit. And that's where we go. But sexuality then becomes interpreted and viewed only through the lens of the sexual sensations that are experienced. The pleasure itself becomes the focus. Instead of the relationship, the marriage, that those sensations and pleasures were designed to serve. This, gentlemen, is how you were programmed sexually. Just about all of us in this culture. And you know what? The devil got you right at the right time also. Because if you think about where you were at in your developmental phase, at ages 10 to 15, by age 12, your limbic system is fully developed. The limbic system is where you have those pleasures and drives and emotions. That thing is going crazy. It's on fire. But you know what's not? The prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until the late 20s or even age 30. So what a diabolical scheme. He downloads this template into young men's minds, boys' minds, when they are not ready for it, when they need the guidance of a loving father, talking to them about sexuality more than what their friends are going to. Yet it didn't happen. So here we stand. And the story continues. The enemy didn't play fair when you were young. He got you while your defenses were down. But let's go further than age 12 now. Let's go to here you now are and you are dealing with these issues from your childhood. And I don't mean just the improper impress of sexuality on the, upon the brain. I want to talk about issues from, real issues from our childhood. And I know we guys don't talk about this kind of thing much. It's just too touchy-feely. It's don't go there with all the emotional stuff. But I'll tell you something. There are probably three things, and this is going to be very real for you and, and, and allow God to, to go into those corners of your heart. There are probably three things that you did not receive enough of as a kid. There are probably three things that are still 
influencing who you are today and how you conduct yourself today and your thoughts and all of these things. The first one is you probably didn't receive the affirmation, love, guidance, and encouragement that you needed from your father. Most men just are struggling in this area. In fact, in counseling pornography addicts, Dr. Ted Roberts has found that literally 98% of the men who are seeking counseling for pornography addiction are struggling with serious insecurities in their lives, significant insecurities. So what that means is we didn't receive the affirmation that we didn't get strengthened and, and didn't acquire confidence from those early years. And so now as grown men, we're walking around with really fragile egos. You know, we put on a tough exterior, but there's a lot of fear really there for, for many men. Fear of, of not being accepted and admired and respected by our, by our peers, by, by other men, by whoever. Fear of not measuring up, just, just fear of being a failure. So we define ourselves by our performance and what this leaves us is very, very stressed or depressed. If we're continually needing to perform in order to feel like we're somebody, we're going to get burned out. We're going to be so stressed or we're going to just feel like we drop the ball again and just feel low and depressed. And that's the result of this. But not just that. I want to tell you a story of a young man who did commit adultery. Probably the most famous adulterer in history, King David. Now, if you look back in King David's family past, there was an interesting occurrence that may have shaped him and damaged him in a serious way, or, or this may be reflective of other things that were happening in his childhood. Do you remember when Solomon, I'm sorry, Samuel came and he was about to anoint the new king and I'm coming to Jesse's house. And so Jesse lines up, David's father, lines up all the brothers, all the, the, the young men of the family. Who's not invited to that whole lineup? David's not there, is he? Jesse said, you know what? He's not going to be worthy to come here. Uh, the word that he used to describe David, he, he says the katan. That's a Hebrew word, Q-A-T-A-N. The katan is, is off tending the sheep. That's an interesting Hebrew word because it can just mean the youngest one. But you know what also this word translates as? The insignificant one, the unimportant one. So David was not considered worthy to be on the lineup for the potential king of Israel. And, and so he may have a serious wound in his life. And he didn't receive that affirmation. He didn't receive that strengthening from his father so that he could take on the world with confidence and no stress or depression. The second thing that you may be struggling with, if you're struggling with pornography and lust today, is not just a lack of affirmation, but sometimes actual wounds from our childhood that cause deep pain within us. We ignore the wounds, we ignore the pain, we deny it, we get busy enough so that we don't need to think about it, and all the while we have these festering wounds from pains in our, in our past. But also a third thing, and this is a big one, most men, especially those struggling with these issues, did not have a deep and intimate relationship with their father. And, and, and the relationship with your father is how you gain an understanding of what relationships are like, how to have intimacy, friendship, a connection with another human being that is most importantly derived from the father. The mother is taken for granted. She's always there. She'll nurture, she'll love. But the father is the one that really helps download that template, if you will, of how to have an intimate, close bond with somebody else and with God for that matter, because he's your picture of God. Your father is your picture of God from early on. Now, when we look at the statistics, 70% of pornography addicts come from disengaged, meaning emotionally disengaged homes. There was no emotional relational connection, particular with their father, no openness, forgiveness. In fact, not just that, but those who identify themselves as fundamentalists in studies have a 91% higher rate of pornography use than those who do not. If you don't know what that term means, a fundamentalist, these are people who identify themselves as, as, as literalists of the Bible. When it says that God created the world in six days, God created the world in six days. I happen to be of that school of thought that, that when God says it, I believe it. And that's what that settles it. I mean, this, that, that's how it went. That's a, a fundamentalist mindset. You might say it's a more conservative worldview of, of Bible, religion, things of God. And the first time I heard that statistic, then I was like, wait a minute. People who have what I believe the correct interpretation of the scripture actually have a higher risk for pornography? Well, I don't think it's their interpretation of scripture or the high standards that their family holds to that caused it. 
However, there is a tendency. It's not a guarantee and it's not inevitable, but there is a tendency, unfortunately, in many homes that have held to strict, strong standards to have that emotional disconnection. It's rigid, it's rules oriented, which we need rules. I, I want high standards, I want strict things, but we need to combine that with love, affirmation, emotional connection, and all of these things. And because we don't get that, we are at higher risk for pornography or other sexual addictions. So the results of these three things, most men, as we said, are stressed or depressed because they didn't receive the affirmation, they don't have the confidence that they need. Secondly though, remember that wounds and pain we live with those deep wounds and pain. And then we actually lack intimacy in our lives today. And so if you think about this, the devil has us right where we want us. He's, not only do we have this, this, this totally warped view of sexuality that I just mentioned, but also we're, we're stressed and depressed. So you go to the pornography and you get this temporary high out of your depression or it relieves the stress, right? And it also medicates that pain from those wounds from childhood. And not just that, pornography is a counterfeit intimacy where we are lacking intimacy in our lives, true deep bonds with human beings, relational connection. Where we are lacking that, pornography fills the gap. More on that in just a second. But pornography then will hold a deep, deep hold on the heart and mind of a man. And, and if not pornography, then again, just any image, just any lust, just any practice. That image shows up on the website or wherever. Even you, you walk into church and the inappropriately dressed young lady, and, and you're just captive to this. You can't help but. You have this reflexive image to, to take a second look. Uh, to hold that gaze for, for even just a, a second and a half. Have you ever sat there with a stopwatch? Probably not. You should sit there with a stopwatch sometime and time out a second and a half. You might think, well, that's, that's not long at all. It would be about like this, like, like that. That's way too long to be looking, right? I mean, that millisecond, you want your eyes bouncing off of there like Jacob fleeing, like Joseph, rather, fleeing. And here we hold that for a second and a half or we take that, se that, that, that second look because it's got a hold on our hearts because of all of these things. Now I want to make you a promise, brothers and sisters. Lust is not inevitable. The Bible says that God will give you a completely renewed mind. Romans 12 verse 2, you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so through this seminar, God is going to retell this whole history of yours. He's going to make you a new person. He's going to reverse all those destructive tendencies so you can say, I can walk in newness of life. So, but you might ask this right now. Well, God, why? Why did God make me this way? Many a man has asked that who is struggling with these. God, just take away my sexual nature. I'd rather not be this way. Why did God make me this way? Well, I want to actually start by saying, you know what? God actually didn't make us this way, the way we are today. You were created in the image not of directly of God, like Adam came, came from the hand of God. You were created in the image of your parents. <laughs> and, and we all retain the image of God in us as well. Jesus is reproducing that in us. But your parents were made in the image of their parents. Their parents were made in the image of their parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve. And so God made Adam and Eve perfectly. They had a sexual nature, yes. And so do we, but ours has become warped. So why are, the way we, why are we the way we are today? First of all, the fall. Humanity became a selfish race after Adam and Eve fell. But then we've had 6,000 years of moral degradation of the human race. We've not been becoming better, only worse in terms of our moral nature. But then we live in 2014, or after that, if you're viewing this later, a hyper-sexualized 21st century, century culture. And then we accept that culture and we inculcate the habits of mind. That's why we are the way we are today. God did not make you this way. Now, by the way, of that list that you just saw, can we do anything about the first two? <laughs> no, we can't do anything about one or two. How about three and four? Can we do something about that? We'll come back to that in a later session. We can do something about these things, but other men say things like, well, I have needs. I have needs so I can engage in this behavior and view these things. Come on, Scott. It's, it's natural. It's normal. Us guys, we, 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 it's just the way we are. I'll say something. It is true that we guys have needs. We have a deep, deep urge and need, an impulsive, irresistible pursuit of something. We can't help but seek it out. 
There's a multi-billion dollar industry that preys upon our need for this. But it's not sex. It's intimacy. And I'm not saying sexual intimacy, just intimacy. I want to talk about intimacy with you this evening. Let's go in the story way, way back. Not your story, but the story of the history of the universe. It begins even before Genesis 1 with the creation of this world. Have you ever read in the Bible in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12, verse 7, you read about this, this angel that was in heaven named Lucifer who was cast out of heaven. Now, why was he cast out of heaven? Why was there a war in heaven, as Revelation 12 says? Well, he said, I, 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 I will ascend the throne of God. I will be like God. There was a rebellion in heaven before this earth was created. Now, you'll see why, how we know it was before the earth was created in a moment. But here you had a, a ambitious, self-centered, self-promoting effort to take the very throne of God on the part of Lucifer, who became, of course, Satan. And in this process of, 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 of waging this rebellion, just like in any rebellion, he is the father of lies, right? The devil is the father of lies. And so he made accusations and lies about God, about the government of heaven. He accused God's character and God's government of being something that it's not. That's when this earth was created. When this earth was created, you see in Job 38, 4 and 7, it says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Notice, when I laid the foundations of the earth. So there, there were sons of God shouting for joy when the earth was created. There were, there were beings already in existence when God laid the foundations of this earth. These beings were the angels. The angels who had just witnessed that rebellion in heaven, they saw this controversy happening between Christ and Satan, and they, they are looking on now. And they're learning. And God creates planet Earth in the context of this, this great controversy, this true story that we find ourselves in still today. And so what, what's happening here, actually, is you read in, in Genesis 1 through 3 that God created this Earth, but not just for us. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9 says, We have been made a spectacle to the world, both to who? To angels and to men. And then it refers in 1 Peter to the gospel. And it says these are things which angels desire to look into. So the angels are learning by watching what's happening on planet Earth. Because they witnessed that rebellion in their minds. Many of them may be wondering what's going on with these accusations. Is God the way he says he is? Does he really allow freedom? Is he really a God of love? Or is he some sort of controlling dictator the way that Satan's making him out to be? And here you have the creation of this earth in that context. We are a spectacle to angels as well as to men. They are desiring to look into these things. What are these things that they are desiring to look into? Well, why did God create the angels to begin with? 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. Now, if God is love and God is the only being in the universe, then can God exercise love sufficiently unless he makes little beings in his image. Just like we, when, when we want to have uh, experience more love and pour out more love onto a little being, we have a baby, right? Well, we're made in the image of God. He's the same way. He created these angels because he is a God of love. He wants a relationship. He wants to be able to give. That's the essence of love. He wants to be a giving being. That's who he is. So he created the angels for that reason. But then he created this earth for the same reason because in Genesis 3 verse 8, we see that God had a practice of walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So God makes earth, plants Adam and Eve in this, in this garden, and then he walks in among them. A walk, walk together. You've heard Enoch walked with God. Well, here you have Adam and Eve walking with God as well in the Garden of Eden. But not just that. We read on in the Bible and we see that God actually said when he created the earth, he didn't say, I am going to make man. He said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man. The first time I read that, I was very puzzled until I studied more deeply into this. God is three beings, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So God says, let us make man in our image. If God is three, then he is a relationship. God in himself, even if there's no angels, is love because there is a self-interloving 
relationship of beneficence, giving one, taking from the other to give, to bless. This is who God is at his core. And I'm coming, I'm having a hard time coming up with words to describe this because this is the creator of the universe we're talking about. This is a character that we will contemplate for the ceaseless ages of eternity with our, our, our 10 with 10 trillion zeros behind it, possible connections and, and configurations in the brain. And here I am just at awe of this God. He is an us. And he says, I'm going to make man how? In our image. We are going to make man in our image, he said. Now, how are mankind made in God's image? Well, he made Adam first. And then he says, it is not good. The sixth day of creation, he made Adam. And then he said, it's not good. Everything else was good in creation until this. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. So he made a helper suitable for him. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So how, in what respect are we made in God's image? Male and female. He created them in his image, male and female, he created them, it says. So if you think about that, it's the male and female relationship which pictures the love of God. It demonstrates, it images the love of God, the, the relational intimacy of God for the world to see. And what a beautiful truth that is. In our marriages, we can, we can actually demonstrate something. And the Bible teaches this very clearly. We read that, that, that marriage not only provides evidence of God's love to people here, but even to the angels, remember, who are looking on. You read all through the Bible. The relationship of God and his people is continually described as a relationship as between a bride and a bridegroom, a husband and a wife. That's the, that's the analogy used in the Bible. So bride and bridegroom is a picture of God's love for his church and his relationship with his people. Isn't that something? Adam, it says, knew his wife. Now that word knew mean, means sexual intimacy in Genesis 4 verse 1. Now, not only do we know our wives, but we see in John 17, not sexual intimacy, but intimacy. It says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, meaning God, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Adam and Eve knowing each other. Intimacy in marriage is a picture of us knowing God, of course, in a different form of intimacy. Now, not just that, but we also see that husbands ought to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Men, why are we called to sacrifice self for the benefit of our lives? Wives, why are we called to, to, to be willing to sacrifice our pleasures, our desires to uplift them? Why are we called to lead them in a servant leadership sort of model? Because that's what God is like. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And marriage is designed to be a picture of that. This is so deep. We also read in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17 that if you are becoming sexually one with a woman, you are one what's called flesh, one flesh with a woman. But then in that same verse, it says, if you're joined to the Lord, you are one spirit with him. So where we have one flesh with a wife, we are one spirit with the Lord. You're seeing the analogy come through loud and clear, right? Because we are a spectacle to angels as well as to men. Accusations were made in heaven about God's character. The, the, the minds of the, un, the onlooking universe are wondering, please teach us about this. We want to look into these things. And what do they see when they look into these things? They can see the character of Christ manifested and reproduced, especially in men but certainly in marriage. Isn't that wonderful? And that's a responsibility, isn't it? Sexuality in marriage is not just about procreation. The animals have that. They're not made in God's image and the animals sexually procreate, many of them. God has given this to us as a, as a very deep, deep spiritual, emotional thing. Sexuality in marriage is a shadow. It's a, it's a, it's a, a type of the true intimacy that God has with his people. And it testifies to the truth of God's character in this great controversy. So really, what is intimacy then at its core? Sexual intimacy, marital intimacy is one kind of intimacy. But intimacy in general, is just a knowing. It's just a relationship, a knowing and being known, a opening of the heart to seek deeply into another. And we all have this as a need, as I said. We all need it. If we're isolated, we're all dysfunctional spiritually and emotionally and mentally. Isolation really, it, it brings death. You actually start physically dying without relational and emotional intimacy. And this can happen in many different contexts. It could be a family. It could be, it could be a close friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
It could be a father passing on wisdom and guidance to his son and, 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 and laughing and playing and enjoying life together as a family. You know, there's many forms of intimacy. To just be close with another, to share the heart, to share the mind, to share the purpose, to have a, to have a befriending, loving, serving experience, a, 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 a personal relationship with somebody. I don't know how else to put it than that. A personal relationship, a deep personal relationship, not a surface thing, but a real, real knowing and being known. Now, marriage is one especially intimate relationship. Sexual intimacy is a expression, an expression of intimacy within marriage. But sexuality, I want to be really clear on this. Sexuality is not synonymous with intimacy. There are many non-sexual forms of intimacy, and we do not have a need to act out sexually. We do have a need for intimacy. This, by the way, is why single people can live very happy, very holy, very emotionally stable and successful lives and spiritually successful because they can have relationships. They can have intimate relationships that aren't sexual as long as they're not isolated. That's the key. We look here. Why then? Finally, why then did God give me a sexual nature? Period. Why did he give Adam one? I realize I've got a pretty warped, hyper-sexual nature. But why did God create sexuality to begin with? Well, we finally answered it, haven't we? The answer is God gave us a sexual nature to drive us toward marital intimacy, which is one especially intimate relationship which teaches us and all of heaven about him. Now, by the way, if you're single and you're going, well, I don't have marital intimacy and I'm not pursuing it. And so what do I do with these these sexual impulses? Stick around for the subsequent sessions. I'll talk about that in sessions five and six. We're going to get more deeply into that issue. But really what I want to think about here is, is, is the male brain. You know, uh, ladies talk a lot about, you know, friendship, relationship, all this emotional stuff. And we guys are like, that's not for me. You know, I, I'm just I'm just, uh, you know, not comfortable talking about that, frankly. And what, what, what we get into with the situation with, with our, our male brain is it's, it's designed in a certain way. The male brain is designed to lock onto that beauty, as I said, right? And, and not just that, but to experience something continually new. We're designed for novelty. We're designed to, to explore more deeply into our wives and understand them at a deeper level. Now, evolutionists have a field day with this one, right? They, they totally misread this. They say, well, clearly we're just animals and we've been programmed just like them through evolution to seek as many different sexual partners as possible. This, was, this is Kinsey, right? And so just go out there and be promiscuous and, and you are at the level of an animal. Not so. We were not programmed to seek multiple sexual partners. God gave us this drive to go deeper emotionally, relationally, spiritually with our wives. So there's a continued freshness, a continued newness. We misread that completely. So the male brain is one track. The male brain is goal oriented. The male brain is visual spatial. And the male brain loves novelty. I've talked about that last one already about novelty, but we're one track minded. We're goal oriented minded. We're visual spatial. Now think about these things. The devil is going to have a playground with this because he takes this programming that was designed to drive us into intimacy with our wives and he diverts it into the lustful images, the pornography, the whatever. And so we're visual spatial, right? The brain, the mind, the imagination can be a playground for lustful fantasies. We're one track, goal oriented. We lock on and we're, we're honed in and we are focused with this lustful experience. So the fantasy the, fate, we, the, the, the beauty we see in, in that, it, it attracts us. We can't help but have that initial, as we saw last session, the initial noticing, but then we really hone in and we really get that experience. It's, 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 it's backfired. The devil has caused our nature to backfire on us instead of to drive us into intimacy with our wives, which is, which is tragic. It's a perverted, perverted experience that the devil has done to our, to our brains. And here's the real, the real problem, though. We guys are intimacy starved. Remember from earlier, we didn't experience that enough as children. So, and, and we don't even have probably enough intimacy with our wives and our close loved ones. Most men today don't have a close male friend. And so we're intimacy starved. And since we're starved for intimacy, we're in this lonely, very isolated world with our video games and our smartphones and Facebook. But even before that, we were intimacy starved. And so you know what happens? We bite at the first thing that poses as intimacy. 
the, the lustful image, the attractive woman, the pornographic ad, whatever it is, you know what that really is communicating to us at our spiritual level? It's communicating, it's, it's got a sales pitch. The sales pitch is, hey, I'm offering you intimacy. The brain thinks it's signing up for intimacy when it locks onto that. We were designed to do that, right? We were designed to pursue that. But unfortunately, it leaves the user completely empty, obviously, because it hasn't been a real form of intimacy. A while back, about a century ago, in America, they brought these gypsy moths to our country. They wanted to grow a silk industry, but instead of growing silk, these gypsy moths reproduced, replicated, and went and destroyed trees in countless numbers. And so the authorities were very concerned about this. They said, what do we do with these gypsy moths? How do we get them under control? They used a bunch of sprays to try and annihilate them. It didn't work. And so they said, okay, we've got it. Somebody thought of a way to get rid of the gypsy moths. They took the scent of a female gypsy moth. And they encapsulated it. They created a synthetic, a fake scent of the female gypsy moth. But this fake scent was way stronger than the real female gypsy moth. Well, guess what happened at mating time? The men start fluttering their wings and go out in search of their women. The male gypsy moths completely ignore the female gypsy moths. They go for the stronger scent. They hone in on that scent and they're going for it because it's promising them what they've been programmed to have, right? Because it's extra strong. It's really alluring. It's just really sucking them in. And you know what happened? They stopped mating. And it was largely successful in annihilating this, this problem. You know what? This is a perfect analogy for what the sex industry has done. What is the sex industry other than a machinery of lies? It says, we're promising you something. We're pro your brain thinks it's going for intimacy, but it's not. And you'll come out of this less intimate with other human beings in your lives and your wife. We'll look at that in a second. But most guys are going to say, I know. Come on, Scott. I know this intimacy, intimacy stuff is big for ladies. But frankly and honestly, for guys, it's just all about pleasure, right? Not so. There was a study that was done. They looked at men that visit prostitutes. And they found that two thirds of them, the majority of them, had a habit of going back to the same prostitute again and again. And in sur surveys and interviews, they would speak about her personality. So even the most debased, distorted, warped, perverted sexual mind, for them, even still, sexuality is faintly connected with relationship, with intimacy. Isn't that something? Is it all about pleasure? Or were we really designed by God? for intimacy. I believe we were. Except we guys tend to fear it. We don't like being emotionally vulnerable. You know, what if I appear weak? Will people know how fragile I really am? You know, it wasn't always this way. We didn't always have these layers of barriers built, us, built between us and our wives and us and our, our male friends and our family. Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, what does it say about them? It says they were naked and unashamed. This, this symbolizes perfect, no incompleteness, perfect openness, no insecurity, just, just perfect oneness, no self-doubt, no, no, no layers and barriers and, and hardness. But then sin came. And when sin came, the blaming, the covering up, the hiding started to take place. And intimacy was destroyed between Adam and Eve, between human beings, and between us and God. This is where it all started, and it's where we stand today. And since we guys are so intimacy starved, I, as I said, we go for the first thing that poses as intimacy. We go for those pellets, those, those, those synthetic capsules of the scent. It's kind of like this. If you're really, really, really hungry, and let's say you walk into a gas station, and your body needs real food, right? But then hostess places before you the delectable, alluring image of a Twinkie. Now your brain says, oh, that's good food. And you want to go for it and eat it because it looks good and you know you've had an experience with sugar like this before and it was pleasurable to you. Question, is a Twinkie food? I think we need to redefine the definition of food. A Twinkie is not food. You know, just, because, just because you can chew it, swallow it, it tastes good and it partially digests in your body, that does not make it food. A Twinkie is a completely counterfeit food. In fact, I'm working on a seminar that I hope to get done next year called Counterfeit Food, looking at the food industry and the lies out there that are in there that are tricking our brains into signing up for it. It's the same thing as with pornography. 
The sex industry is a machinery of lies. It's tricking us in to this program. And so here you have Christ's way versus Satan's way. Christ's way of intimacy and sexuality is intimacy. Satan's way, isolation. Christ's way is selflessness. Satan's way, selfishness. Christ's way leads to peace and joy. And Satan's way leads to shame. You know, selfishness says, I am going to consume you. I am going to deny your worth and value, either subconsciously or consciously. As a person, no, you're, you're an object for my, my pleasure, to serve my pleasure. So it demeans and degrades the human value of a woman. Other-centeredness, though, says something different. Instead of selfishness, other-centeredness says, you are God's purchased possession. I desire your purity. I desire your soul to be saved and your happiness I want you to be in heaven. And so I'm going to sacrifice my pleasures to uplift you before God in purity of mind. More on that in the last sessions. Oh, we can replace these thing, bad things with such good things. So we call, a, we call them users of pornography. Isn't that an appropriate term? We say that they are consumers of pornography. And we call it pornographic material. Human beings now degraded to the level of material to be used and to be consumed. What a sad situation Satan has gotten us into. And pornography does destroy intimacy. Continual exposure to pornography in studies. Oh, this is amazing. Continual exposure to our pornography leads to diminished trust between intimate couples, the abandonment of the hope of sexual monogamy, the belief that promiscuity is the natural state, cynicism about love or the need for affection between sexual partners, and the belief that marriage is, success, is sexually confining. Now, if you think about that, does pornography destroy true intimacy or what? It does all these things that you've seen here and more. In another study, after viewing pornographic video segments, viewers were put in a seemingly unrelated social situation with women. So they had these men view pornography, and then they put them in a social situation with women and observe their behavior. This is what they found. Compared with a control group of men who didn't view porn, these pornography users, one, spent longer periods of time averting their partner's touch and gaze. And they interrupted their partner more. So these are signs of waning intimacy, decreasing intimacy. And also they stared at their partner and they advanced to touch their partner more. So they're interested in sexual things without intimacy. Pornography destroys intimacy and leads to isolation. These guys just wanted to consume them. They didn't want to have eye contact. They didn't want to have any sort of real communication. They just wanted to consume them with their eyes. A 2005 study of internet users showed a significant correlation between pornography use and, guess what, loneliness. It's isolating, right? And depression. In fact, there's one depression recovery um, community that I know of uh, a recovery center, depression recovery center, that ha has, has identified that nearly 100% to a man, everybody coming in to receive treatment is, is engaged in, in these practices, in, 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 at the very least in forms of self-abuse and masturbation. And so this is so common in causing depression. We're going to talk about that more in session three, so stick around for that. But when the isolation in the porn world is taking over, the soul can't have intimacy. Intimacy and isolation can't occupy the same territory. If you're isolated, you can't be intimate. If you're intimate, you're not isolated. But then as isolation takes hold, we become disconnected from God too, not just with people. We become alone, walking this thing alone. We say, I'll just figure this out later, but here's what we, here's what we need to hear sometimes. Now is the time, gentlemen. It says, and let none flatter themselves that sins cherished for a time can easily be given up by and by. You can't say, I'll deal with this in a more serious way later. I don't want to go all, I don't really want to lay it all on the line and do all the things you're going to recommend and, and the things that really need to be done to solve this thing. I'll deal with this later. I'm doing okay now. I haven't looked at it in a while. No, don't flatter yourself. It says, continuing with the quotation, it says these sins cannot be given up by and by. This is not so. Every sin cherished weakens the character and strengthens habit. And physical, mental, and moral depravity is the result. You may repent of the wrong you have done and set your feet in right paths, but the mold of your mind and your familiarity with evil will make it difficult for you to distinguish between right and wrong. Through wrong habits formed, Satan will assail you again and again. 
So we're battling against fleshly desires in a very serious and real way. Desire is not a bad thing in and of itself. You can desire something good. When Jesus said, I desire to eat this Passover with my disciples. This is, this is Good Friday. This is right before he went to the cross. I desire to eat this Passover with my disciples. That word he used right there, the Greek word for desire, is the same word translated as lust in other places. So was that a holy desire? Of course it was a holy desire. We can have a desire for higher things. And I'm going to close with Psalm 37 with regards to our desires. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Did you hear it? Trust in the Lord. Feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. If you do those things, he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. This is God's promise to you. If I feed on his faithfulness, if I pursue this victory in this healing process to its natural end, if I pursue God in the most deep and intimate way that I, like, like I've never done before, I open up my heart for healing. I say, God, I have struggled in many ways and I have fear and I have insecurities and I have intimacy problems and I want healing, complete deep healing, not just new behaviors, not just not doing that anymore, but I want a new experience with you and with my fellow human beings that you were designed for so that we can be a spectacle to angels, so we can see Jesus come again. That's what we want, but it requires that we feed on his faithfulness, that we trust in the Lord, and then he will give us the desires of our heart because we'll have a new heart and a right spirit that will desire only the things of God. And I know that sounds impossible at this point. How can my heart possibly only desire the things of God? I'm so drawn to these things out here. Stick with me. Stick with God on this. He will show you the way.